Wow, thank you so much. Let's take our Bibles and open them to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 8, is where we will be at today. And I just wanted to reference the passage that I read from Isaiah 66, those first two verses. Um, in that first verse, God is expressing the heavens, the earth, everything. It's all His. It's already His. He made it. And he asked kind of a question there, what could you possibly give me for Christmas? I'll put it in that context there. You ever wonder, what do you get someone for Christmas that has everything? Or at least you think they have everything? God has everything. What could we possibly give him? He not only has it all, he made it all. And then he answers that question for us in verse 2. A man that is... Uh, poor and of a contrite spirit, so someone who's meek in heart, and then the last part of that verse, it says, and trembleth at my word. We're about to enter the words of God. What is our attitude when we enter the word of God? If you read your Bible every day of the week, that's great, but what's your attitude when you do it? It's a got to do thing, right? I got to check my list off on my calendar to make sure I do it. You are entering the words of God. <laughs> if, if, um, oh, I don't know how many of you would know. Have you ever heard the name Warren Buffett? Wow, imagine if I could schedule him to be here, not on a Sunday, because Sunday is all about God, but I could schedule him to be here on a Saturday evening, okay, and he's going to give us advice on how to invest money in the next five years, okay? Uh, I think we'd have a pretty good crowd here, first of all, uh, but you would be listening to what he is saying, because of who saying it. You would be trembling at his word, so to speak. These are God's words we're looking at today. And that needs to be our perspective anytime we go into the Bible. Last week, we saw Jesus was in the region of the Gadarenes. And you can look there in Luke chapter 8, prior to verse 40. Um, and he commanded evil spirits to leave a, a man. Ooh, an exorcism. That's big. That's exciting, right? Um, the evil spirits, they left the man, went into a herd of swine, ran these pigs down the hill into a lake, and they all drowned. Um, the people of that area made him leave because of what he had just done. Now, this man that had the evil spirits... He was known in the area. He lived in the cemetery, naked, running around, terrorizing. They tried to confine him with, with bands, and he broke through those. So they, they knew the state of this man. And Jesus healed him, and they made him leave. And we kind of looked at their response to that. He left, and there is no mention in Scripture that he ever went back to this area. That's key. As we move on now in chapter 8, we find that when he left the area of the Gadarenes, he went back to Galilee. And there's a quick comparison here, I think, that we need to take, to take note of. Look with me at chapter 8, verse 40. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned from the region of the Gadarenes back to Galilee, the people there gladly received him for they were all waiting for him the people in the region of the gadarenes they rejected him they wanted him out he was rejected now what do we normally do with rejection what do we do what do we do when our feelings get hurt there that's something we can maybe all uh, connect with. How do you respond when your feelings get hurt? What do we do when things don't go our way? Okay. Now, 
we can all talk about little children in Walmart. But big children in church can sometimes do the same things, right? Only in big children ways, grown-up ways. What do we do when people say things about us? So I want to look at what to do with rejection, first of all. One people, one, one people drove him away, um, and the other people hoped in him. They wanted him. They were waiting for him, the Bible says. One country was closed to him. The other country was, or the other area was opened to him. So what should Jesus do? Well, he was here to work, right? God sent him to this earth to work. He was rejected. He got his feelings hurt. Maybe they said stuff as he was walking away. And you know, as he was walking away, you know they were talking about him after he left, saying all kinds of things about him. I'm sure of that. Don't we do that in our minds sometimes? We create truth that we don't know if it's true or not, but we convince ourselves it's truth. He left that country, but he was here to do work. He, 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 when, when he was rejected by a people, he did not retaliate and strike back. We need to note that. When he, we, are rejected by people, get our feelings hurt, he did not retaliate and strike back. He did not begin to moan, grumble, hit social media, <laughs> complain about that. So he didn't do that either. He didn't retaliate, didn't strike back, didn't moan, grumble, complain. He didn't slip into discouragement or even depression. He got rejected, got his feelings hurt, whatever. And he didn't go into discouragement mode. He didn't go back to his mama's house in Nazareth and sit there for several weeks licking his wounds. He didn't quit. He was here to work. That's why God sent him here. He, if, so what did he do? He immediately left the people that rejected him, maybe even hurt his feelings. He left the people. He left those country, that, that country of those who rejected him. But he sought to minister. He says, I've got to keep working. And so he went back to Galilee. He didn't just go home to Nazareth. And, and lick his wounds and fight bitterness that was in his heart over it. He didn't hold a grudge. We, we could say that after the rejection, after the hurt, he just got back in. <laughs> except, except this, and here's why we can't say that. Here's why we can't say after the hurt, after the rejection, he just got back in. We can't say that because he never got out. He just kept going. It never sidelined him. It, he never stepped out even for a moment. They rejected him and he immediately went somewhere else to work. Luke chapter 8 and verse 41, it says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he, Jairus, had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Here's what we learn here is this matter of self-denial. Jairus was a religious ruler. These are marks that we're looking at that are marks of faith, by the way. He was the head of a synagogue. We read that. The synagogue was the center of Jewish life. Everybody knew Jairus, especially being the head of the center of Jewish life. 
He approached Jesus willing to pay the ultimate price. Now, what could that have been? Jesus didn't ask for any money. Keep in mind, at this point in Jesus' ministry, all of the religionists, all of the religious people were opposing him. And he's willing to pay the ultimate price. The religionists were attacking Jesus publicly, openly, speaking against him. And Jairus was running the risk of losing face with his peers. It didn't matter. What he was going to lose, he needed Jesus. He was denying self, maybe even losing his position. So what did he do? He forgot self. He laid aside pride, and he fell at Jesus' feet. Now, we're not talking about us having a child at home that needs to be healed by Jesus, so we need to do self-denial. But we need to lay aside pride and fall at Jesus' feet. Remember what I said at the beginning about trembling at the words of God, approaching it with a poor and contrite spirit, a submissive heart, a humble heart, not the heart that hears God's word and says, well, I don't really agree with that. It's not the same for me, okay? These are the words of God when we read the Bible. So take me out of the picture. And if we could just put a, a, a holographic image of God here, reading the Bible to you. And when you say, well, I don't agree with that. God, you've got it wrong. You don't understand God. Your words don't apply to me. Wow. How about forgetting self? Forgetting what you think about God's word and just looking at what God says. Pride keeps so many people from coming to Christ. Pride is what keeps so many Christians from coming to Christ. Those that would call themselves Christians. It keeps people from coming to Christ because I prayed a prayer when I was a little kid, a little kid. I pray every day that Jesus will save me. I was baptized. Or how about this? Everyone already thinks I'm saved. What would they think if I admit that I'm not saved? Well, okay, there's, there's no real fruit in my life to say that I am a Christian, but what will people think if I admit that I am not saved? Pride. That's what that is. Folks, if that's you, and if you struggled with this, recognizing that you don't see fruit of a Christian in your life, and so God's word said, if, there is, if there's no fruit, then if there ain't apples, it ain't an apple tree. If there ain't Christian fruit, it ain't a Christian because Christians bear fruit. That's what God's word says. And if you've struggled with that and thought about that and had the thought that what would people think? Really? You would really value what people think more than spending eternity in hell? Forget about what people think. I'll tell you what people think. Christians, here's what real Christians will think. Woo, yes! <laughs> he finally got his head on right, or she did. Satan got beat. That would be exciting. Pride says, I have prayed a prayer. I go to church. I was baptized. I do good things. I'm a good person. Pride does not run with faith. They're not the same. They can't be together. James chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. And then in James 4.10, just a few verses down, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, 
and he shall lift you up. Jairus' faith was revealed in his willingness to just lay aside self what people are going to think. But his faith was also revealed in the fact he was willing to lose for the sake of someone else. It was his daughter. But he was willing to lose something for the sake of someone else. He begged Jesus to help. He believed. He believed faith with all his heart that Jesus could save his daughter. Perhaps, perhaps he was, as a Jewish person, he knows the Old Testament. The leader of a synagogue, he really knows the Old Testament. Perhaps he remembered what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 91, 15. He shall call upon me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Now, Jesus knew his heart. He knew, he knew Jairus' faith. And what happened? Jairus' faith was rewarded. Jesus went to his house. But the problem, as it says in the last part of our verse that we read there, Jesus is going to his house, and then just a phrase on the end, but the people were clamoring around him or something to that effect. Uh, they were all around him with his needs, and he, and he couldn't quite get to the house. The man's daughter is dying. It's urgent. It, it, it was kind of like five years ago or whatever it was when, when the tornado came through here, um, I, I had that busload of ladies. We went to St. Louis Christmas shopping. Woo <laughs> That's a fun thing to do, guys, if you ever want to come with me. <clears throat> and we got back, I don't know, half hour after the tornado came through here. The streets were choked and not with tree limbs. Gawkers who needed to have their tires shot out and their cars bulldozed to the side of the road so that emergency vehicles could get through, utility vehicles could get through. The roads were choked with people clamoring to see the destruction from the tornado. This is what Jesus was facing. Everything was blocked, people all around him. Let's look at what the Bible says in verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she was found out, uh-oh, she came trembling, falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole Go in peace. So here we see um, an attribute of faith in this word hopelessness. This woman was desperate in total despair. Said she had an issue of blood for 12 years, okay? This was, this was a female bleeding, okay? struggled with how to approach this sensitively, but God talked about it, so will we. And it didn't stop. 12 years. Now, I'm a guy, I get this, but this isn't something that she would talk about with people. It was, it was a private, personal matter. She certainly didn't want it discussed publicly. But if we go back and, and look at verse 47, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him. She just spilled it out there in front of this throng of people. She didn't want it discussed publicly, 
maybe that's why she didn't try to say, Jesus, heal me. I've had this female bleeding for 12 years. Can you help me? <laughs> she just touched the edge of his garment, believing that's all she needed to do. She acted in faith. Now, keep in mind, there were a lot of people touching him, the throng of people. But only one of those people touched him in faith such that he said he felt virtue leave him. I guess we might describe that as he felt some healing energy leave him with just that one touch. And when she did touch him, the Bible says the bleeding stopped immediately. He called her out. She responded with confessing her deliverance from that problem. Now, there is, is a picture here of public, not secret, discipleship. She had privately come to Jesus. Jesus had healed her of her physical malady, okay? But there's a picture here. She didn't just keep it private. She told people, Jesus delivered me. Jesus delivered me from my sin, from my problems. Here's what Jesus did for me. It wasn't, it wasn't a case of secret discipleship. Well, I believe that my religious relationship is between me and God and no one else's business, and I don't need to talk about it with others. Wrong. <laughs> we don't see that encouraged anywhere in God's Word. Jesus does something for you, and you tell everyone what Jesus has done for you. And the first place that God... Now, there's many ways we could do that. Okay, we could, we, could, we could paint it on the side of our house. We could uh, write it on every piece of mail that we mail out. We could put a gospel track in every bill we pay. We could, we could paint it on the side of our car. Um, we could take bleach and burn it in our front yard in the grass. Um, we, could, we could do it all over social media. Here's what Jesus did for me. Lots of ways we can do that. There is only one way that God commands us to do it, and that's in this baptistry right behind me. All the other ways, God says, you take your pick. But this, you must do. This is my method, once you accept Christ, to publicly confess what Jesus has done for you. And here she is. She acted in faith. All these people touching him. He called her out. She responded with confessing her deliverance. Look with me at Luke chapter 12 and verse 8. It'll be up on the screen. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Here's what this is saying. Saved people talk about their salvation. Jesus isn't saying here, that verse we just read, if you don't talk about your salvation, then I'm going to stop talking about you to God and you lose your salvation. No, 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 no. What he's saying here, if you are saved, then you will talk about your salvation. It's one of those fruits of a Christian. Saved people talk about their salvation. This woman's faith was rewarded she was called by jesus in the last verse that we read from our passage she was called daughter that's the first time a, a woman has been called daughter of god she was a a child of god she was given comfort she was given peace after 12 years of this medical problem that, that she had. And if you, if you know your Old Testament laws regarding women that are bleeding, she was separated. She was an outcast. If she was married for 12 years, she had to be, she'd been separated from her husband based on Old Testament laws. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So let's apply this verse, okay? 
If there is a time when you have no peace, let's look at the verse again. Peace, Jesus is speaking. Peace, I leave with you. So it's a statement. Jesus left peace with us. My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled because of that. And don't be afraid. So if we're applying that verse, if there is ever a time that we have no peace, then we're missing Jesus. Either that or Jesus isn't doing what he said he did by giving us peace. No peace, we're missing Jesus in there. Something is wrong. We're missing something in our life if we have no peace. And many times we'll try to blame it on different things. It was this circumstance. It's this situation. It's this money. It's the economy. It's the politics. It's my bad hair day, whatever it is. We're missing Jesus because Jesus enters the picture and brings peace. John 16, it says, These things, Jesus speaking, have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Everything that we face in our, our last week, all the stuff that was aggravating, okay, <laughs> brought a chill to our bones, um, disrupted our life. God's overcome all of that. And we missed it if we allowed it to take away our peace. We missed God in those moments. Here's, a, here's another character trait of faith, and it's this word helplessness. So Jesus finally gets done with this woman as he's trying to get to Jairus' house. Did we forget about him? <laughs> I'm sure Jairus is standing there Jesus stops dealing with this woman. He's like, oh, man, would you come on? Come on, we got to hurry up. Ugh, these interruptions. Look with me at verse 49. While he yet spake, he's still talking with this woman. There cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Jairus, thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, they immediately went right to the house. He suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father of the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Well, that's going to make you feel good. Don't you love it when you get laughed at? <laughs> but they're laughing at Jesus, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Maid, arise. Her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. He finally arrived at Jairus' house. He was too late. Jairus' daughter died while he was speaking with that woman in the road. And someone told Jairus, just go home and forget about it. Jesus responded, we could, we could summarize verse 50 this way. Jairus, fear not. Believe. Fear not. Believe. Fear and faith do not go together. The parents' stubborn faith was rewarded because right there on the street, someone from his house said, Jared, forget about it. Jairus, forget about it. She's dead. Don't trouble Jesus anymore. Jairus could have said when Jesus said, all right, let's go. Jairus said, no, nah, it's too late, Jesus. But his faith persisted. Parents specifically need stubborn Faith in behalf of their children. We, 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 can't, we can't ignore what comes first, though. A faith 
that forgets and denies oneself and is focused on seeking Jesus. We're not talking about the kind of faith that when the world collapses, suddenly we're on our knees begging God with earnestness and with complete faith that he's going to do this because we're seeing some things take place before God did anything here. Self-denial, focused on seeking Jesus before anything else. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 21 It says this, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. I'm not suggesting that we need to go out and start throwing mountains around or trees. (laughs) But guys, we have some mountains in our lives, don't we? Whether it's work-related, relationship-related, church-related, child-related, financially, God rewards faith. I don't know if it's the same kind of faith that we turn on when everything's collapsing. All of a sudden, we got faith in Jesus. Jesus is going to fix this. Where was that faith a week ago before the problem came up? When everything was going fine, do we still have Jesus is going to fix this? Let's talk about Jesus and what Jesus has done. That's the faith that we see Jesus rewarding here. This self-denying, focusing on Jesus kind of faith. This, um, uh, a realization that we are absolutely helpless without God. And that's where the self-denial comes in. Don't raise your hands, but here's a fun question. How many of you believe that you would be spiritually okay if you went a whole month without stepping foot in these doors? You just kind of like went on vacation for a month, didn't open your Bible, didn't talk about Jesus, talked to Jesus, Jesus didn't talk to you for a whole month, and you'd be okay. Don't raise your hand. But if you think you would be okay, something's wrong. We need Jesus every day. And we need to approach him not, not, um, not out of, God, look at me. Here I come again. Woo. Three days in a row. Wow. Aren't I special? Approach him this way. I am nothing. God, I need you today. Forget going a whole month without you. I need you just for today. I can't get through this day without you. That's how we approach Jesus. And and when we approach Jesus that way, we're recognizing self-denial, okay, our own helplessness, hopelessness, but we're approaching Jesus with the faith that he's the only one that can get us through this day. That's a faith that God rewards. He gives grace to the humble. 